Well, I knew we weren't going to get away from the Cinderella image. And indeed, this has been around, I reckon, over 30 years that people have been referring to postnatal as the Cinderella service. And it will be very nice to feel that we can stop doing this quite soon. Apart from anything else, in my view, Cinderella is not really a very appropriate metaphor because although she had a tough time and was badly treated by her stepmother and her stepsisters, actually, she did get a fairy godmother. She did get a lovely dress to go to the ball in. She did go to the ball. She did meet the handsome prince. And apparently, after the shoe episode, they got married and they lived happily ever after. So I'm going to try in these few minutes to see if we can get Cinderella have get some ideas for getting Cinderella um, a little bit nearer to that um, lovely, happily ever after life in the palace. But it is going to start um, a little bit bleaker. You may, you probably all heard of Holly McNish, who's wrote some absolutely amazing, usually very short, but very poignant poems about having babies, breastfeeding, great many things that are relevant to midwifery and just giving you a few seconds to read through this one if you haven't known it before but I actually feel the last three words here are often two key things for women who've become mums especially for the first time and come home if they've given birth um, in a hospital or outside the home and in the first few days there will be weeping and there will be bleeding. And up to a point, that's normal. But after a few days or even a few weeks, if mums are still weeping and still bleeding a lot of the time, that is not normal. But how do they know they need help? And these two are not the only problems, of course, that occur in postnatal care. But it just struck me that they are symbolic of the mental and emotional well-being that mums should be supported to have and the physical recovery, the, the support through physical recovery that they also need in order to be the parents that they want to be. This is also rather a bleak slide. It will get better, I promise. And I'm sure that I'm not telling anyone anything new about what women have experienced, uh, particularly during the recent months and the last year. Um, and this is a very recent report from the, the RISC study, the WRISC, um, which is uh, a joint study um, run by the University of Cardiff and BPAS, uh, and funded by the Welcome, but NCT have been uh, joint investigators on it. And it's done some very um, insightful and helpful work about how to talk about risk to pregnant women. But they also did this report about the experiences, this one particularly about postnatal care during the pandemic. To be honest, much of what's being said here might have been said before the pandemic in the worst cases, because I have read similar things um, about women's experiences when they are in a service that is very overstretched. But I think a lot of these things will have been made worse during COVID because there is less face-to-face -face care. And midwives, we know, are so busy and the workforce is suffering from sickness and those who have to isolate. So where it was overstretched before, it has been threadbare. I just, I won't read out all this because I think you know it, but particularly with the first story, which is a woman on the postnatal ward, it just strikes me. She's saying, oh, the staff was so busy. The staff lacked time to explain things. She's not having a go at the midwives or the MSWs or the doctors or anyone else. Um, she's very unhappy, but she knows that's because you're busy. She is actually being kind, compassionate and forgiving about midwives and really shouldn't have to be the job of the women being looked after at that time. 
Um, but we do hear this over and over again, perhaps because postnatal women are beginning to be full of oxytocin. They don't want to have um, unpleasantness and confrontations. They want to love their midwife as well as their baby. So repeatedly we hear, oh, the poor staff were so busy. I didn't like to bother them, but it shouldn't be what happens. I'm going to move on, you'll be pleased to know, to beginning to look about what ought to be done in postnatal care. I'm going to say these 10 points emerged. It's something that people at NCT with some other colleagues just pulled together, not really for one specific purpose, but just to try and summarise the things that came up over and over again. Um, this is partly the result we did, um, published a report in 2010, a long time ago now, called Left to Your Own Devices. And a lot of these things, uh, that was all about postnatal care. And I think the title speaks for itself. It was uh, a woman's words that she just felt she was left to get on with it. Um, we had a survey in 2013, uh, which was published as Support Overdue, and we repeated that survey in 2017. So it's the results of these repeated surveys um, uh, that showed this is what pretty clearly should happen. And many of these are set out in policy or set out in nice guidelines or national policy documents that all these things should happen. And they're not rocket science. They're not in themselves um, too ambitious or very expensive, but we know in a lot of places they're not actually happening. And a lot of the themes here, I think the phrases like joined up, follow up, communication, consistent information, consistent content. It's about the fact that postnatal care happens in a service from too many individuals, too many different systems, too many employing organizations. Uh, hospital trusts, sometimes a different community employer, um, local authorities or Public Health England who are commissioning and providing the health visiting service, and then the GPs who um, uh, run primary care uh, in a, according to a contract with the NHS, as you know. Uh, I haven't mentioned obstetricians, who some of whom are very interested in um, postnatal care and do like where they possibly can uh, to see women who need more medical care. But these 10 things, I think, sum up a lot of what is needed. And I know that quite a few of these things were being done um, during the implementation part of the Better Births Policy Review. So there has been progress, um, but I think not enough yet. I wanted to take a little deviation to look at quality. Um, again, this is a quote from um, a document which is probably familiar to many from quite a few years ago, but I don't think much has changed. Uh, three key elements in quality care, and this could be any kind of care. Um, so I would normally for maternity say woman-centered or personalized rather than person-centered, but that is, is the term in this um, Health Foundation work. And sadly, I think that postnatal care falls short on all of these. Um, most of it is safe, as most of maternity care in the UK is safe. But sadly, a lot of the maternal deaths that take place are in postnatal care, so we cannot say that it is safe. Effective is a huge question mark, because that means providing services based on evidence and produce a clear benefit. The evidence is widely lacking, because research that covers the whole of postnatal care is almost absent in the last um, five to 10 years, I would say. Please correct me if I'm wrong. There have, of course, been studies of particular aspects of postnatal care, uh, like infant feeding support or uh, pelvic floor health, um, and of course, postnatal mental health. But what I feel is there should be quality right across the fields of postnatal care. And that means somebody 
taking account of all these dimensions of quality. I'm going on to look at some groups of mothers. Again, I don't think that um, this is going to surprise anybody. Uh, there are a number of groups we know who are more vulnerable to worse outcomes from pregnancy, from birth, and of course, from postnatal care. And I wanted to flag up really at the beginning, those very small groups, uh, fortunately, um, but very, very key in terms of those women who need postnatal care, those who are bereaved because their baby has died, those who are in prison, um, and we know there are um, there has been quite a bit of that care highlighted. It is very sparse for women who have to go straight back to prison um, without their baby. And some of the most distressing stories of, of maternal suicides have been related to that. Uh, some women are very severely ill mentally or physically and cannot look after their baby. They still need postnatal care very much so. And the fourth group I've highlighted here is where baby very sadly has to be taken away because the mother is deemed not to be able to uh, be responsible for caring that baby. Again, those women need the postnatal care that all women should have after a birth. So please, small numbers here, but they, they need care. Uh, more groups who are... Um, more vulnerable to worse outcomes. Um, these are perhaps more widely looked at, particularly we've got here uh, the higher rates of mortality associated with women in the Black, Asian and minority ethnic uh, communities, uh, those from lower socioeconomic groups, older women, um, women who smoke, women with higher body mass index. And all of these have been paid more attention to during pregnancy and intrapartum care, but I don't hear so much about what happens to them in the postnatal period. If it puts them at higher risk during pregnancy and birth, they will remain at higher risk in general because all these things go on. They don't disappear. Women don't get uh, a lower BMI or less age once they've had their baby. So we do need to think about these as much as we do in pregnancy and birth during postnatal, how can we make sure they're all right and that appropriate follow-up is carried out? I'm gonna switch for a minute to just saying, I come from NTT, we do care a lot about women in the postnatal period. And this was a particular campaign that I hope you heard of. Um, it reached its, um, climax about a year ago when the the um, demand we were making to have a properly funded and manda mandated postnatal check for women was agreed to in England uh, so that from April the 1st last year this has been funded that all women should have this check. We are going to pick that up again next month and see if women are having it. I'm sure we'll be told, well, the last year hasn't been exactly a normal one, and I'm prepared to say back, no, it hasn't. Has the need for a postnatal check, especially of women's mental health, gone away? No, it hasn't. It is even greater than it was before. So um, this should be done. And the Royal College of GPs has agreed and is uh, bringing guidance and training to its members. So we want to make sure that is happening. We are also um, updating all the time our um, information on our website. A lot of that is about COVID, but I wanted to flag up what we do in postnatal because we feel, and this is from women's feedback, that knowing what is normal, uh, I'll go back once again to the weeping and the bleeding. How do you know how much of that is right? We do help on this. The picture there, uh, a lot of you may be familiar, both either from real life or from seeing this page before. It's a baby's nappy on day three to four. If you don't know what they look like, the different colours of baby's poo can be absolutely alarming for, um, for new mums. So that's, that's just an example of what we do on the NCD website. Uh, I haven't got a slide about it, but I will throw in the fact that we've been 
um, wildly and manically putting out services for, uh, not really wild and manic, but with great vigour and energy all across the country running walk and talk groups uh, for new mums and dads so they can get together and meet new parents, other new parents in the locality in real life. And I cannot tell you how many times new parents have said that has been a lifeline to their sanity. And it means they can make friends in real life, then go home and pick up with all the online ways of doing that. So a few things that NCT has been doing. And I'm going to close about there and we're going back to Cinderella. And I was told earlier this week in a completely different context that midwives love an acronym. So here we are. This is Cinderella back in the palace. There is the pink palace with those letters. And this is what I want to see because I think this is about what the systems need to be, not the individuals. I know the individuals are out there doing what they possibly can. But we need postnatal action from the top. We need postnatal action in leadership, in accountability and ensuring continuity and consistency. And we need equality or equity right across all those groups of women, all of them, including those who are more vulnerable to worse outcomes. I will be going on about this, particularly leadership for postnatal, because I think it is almost completely lacking when you look at that period from birth to six or eight weeks. It's too fragmented. And if we had some leaders there, I think that would improve everything. So thanks very much for listening. That's me. And uh, let's have some good discussion after. Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.